It's hurricane season and we've got the latest on Harvey, Irma and Hurricane Trump. We'll break down the latest on the DACA announcement and what's next for Dreamers. And the chairman of the California Democratic Party, Eric Bauman, joins us to discuss the future for Democrats, uh, largest state party, on the first episode back on the new Political Beat. You're tuning into the destination for TV superfan discussion, After Buzz TV. And now, let the buzz begin. Hey guys, welcome to After Buzz TV, the political beat, the millennial show and podcast, breaking down the latest in Washington politics and news from around the country and world. Hope you all had a great Labor Day weekend. I'm your host, Drexel Hurd. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Drexel Hurd. And I'm Chelsea Galicia, just on Instagram and Twitter, at Chelsea Galicia. It's been a long time, Chelsea, since I've seen you. Mm, not that long, but... Since I've seen you in home. Uh, home, in uh, our new home. Oh, I was with like... With a new logo. I'm like, we just saw each show. other about a week ago. I we did. can't believe you missed me that much. I know, it's, it's always... It's always sad when I don't see you during the week. Uh, be sure to follow this uh, this show at Political Beat TV. Brand new show here on a new network. We've retired, as you can see, political culture for a slight upgrade. Lots of amazing guests coming on the show this season, uh, starting with today's guests. And a bit of a more structured show to make it easier to follow. Uh, in the first beat, we'll give you a rundown of today's top headlines, followed by this week's interview with Eric Bauman. And in the breakdown, we'll talk about the future of DACA with immigration attorney Belen Gomez. Then we'll spotlight all hands volunteers, followed by updates on the show in the final beat. So uh, Oof, let's to cover. get into the first beat. Okay, the thing that I've been like partially uh, in denial about this whole North Korea thing, but I guess we gotta talk about it and I've gotta face it. The fact that last week North Korea tested a missile over Japan and that this weekend they announced that they had completed another hydrogen-based missile that can be attached to an ICBM, which required a little bit of a study on my part because I didn't know exactly what that meant. It, it's, it's, it's no less frightening when the you actually understand it. Intercontinental ballistic missile. Yes, not yes. all of us have a military background, Drexel. That's all right. That's which what I'm here for. Which is a guided ballistic missile with a range of at least 30 400 miles, primarily designed for nuclear weapons delivery. Doesn't that make you feel better? It always makes you feel better. Uh, Defense Secretary Mattis said Sunday that the U.S. was not looking to the total annihilation of North Korea, but that we have many options to do so. That Are you makes really? Me feel better. I can't. I can't. I just whatever. <laughs> Uh, today, the United Nations Security Council called an emergency meeting yesterday at the request of five of the permanent seven of the, five of the seven permanent powers. Uh, Russia and China have always suggested a freeze for, uh, freeze for freeze effort, suggesting North Korea declare a moratorium on their nuclear program if the U.S. and South Korea would refrain from large-scale military exercises. And then I'm not sure if I like the Nikki Haley statement better than the Mattis statement. They're equally profound. Right. Um, UN Secretary Nikki Haley stated that we have kicked the can down the road long enough and there is no more road left. Um, and that North Korea was begging for war but has urged diplomacy. Begging for war. They're over there just asking for it. Mm -hmm. Well, we will uh, keep you guys updated on that. Um, but Hurricane Irma is headed toward the Atlantic coast. We haven't coast. even breathed from Harvey. I know. We're still trying to Still, there's still recovery efforts from the last uh, Category 5 uh, um, storm. storm. On the heels of Hurricane Harvey, Hurricane Irma has been upgraded to a Category 5 storm, making it potentially one of the most catastrophic and powerful hurricanes on the Atlantic coast has ever seen. Uh, category, form, category 5 storms along the Atlantic have only happened a handful of times previously, with the most recent being Katrina, Matthew, and, of course, now Irma. Uh, Florida Governor Rick Scott has declared a state of emergency for the state, has activated the National Guard and has told his residents to, pre to prepare for the worst. Right before the show, Chelsea and I were talking about how um, this is a great time for tax cuts, right? Right. It's always Republican-led tax, tax cuts. cuts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see how soon they start singing th that song. Right. Well, yeah, we're going to be monitoring these headlines and more and updating you. So uh, follow us on Twitter at Political Beat TV. TV. Uh, but no stranger to headlines and policy. He's currently the newly elected chairman of the California Democratic Party, the largest state Democratic Party in the country. Welcome to the program, Chairman Eric Bauman. But, but full disclosure before we start this interview, for those who have listened to the show before, you know that I am not only an elected delegate to the California Democratic Party, but I also voted for Eric in this year's chair's race. So, Sucker. <laughs> <laughs> so let's start with the chair's race, because I was there in Sacramento. It was great. It was my first one. And... Uh, 
was uh, very proud to obviously support uh, Chairman Bauman in the race. Um, after the presidential, after a presidential primary, Eric, uh, that pitted traditional Democrats against uh, the left flank. <laughs> oh, that's what Drexel has called us. And I'm like, isn't flank another word for fat? And he's like, yes, that sounds right for you, left <laughs> fat. Right. We were going to call that the progressive, the progressive wing. wing. I, I think that's uh, not what you call or describe this at all or no, what no, happened no. in that election <laughs> because many of my old friends, no, no, I, I, many of my old well, friends were on, right. on what no, no, you're no. calling the left flank. Uh, well, we're, we're talking about the primary, the presidential primary, that the, the presidential primary kind of got us there, not necessarily this chair's race. Um, but the New York Times recently had an article titled Democratic Fight in California is a warning for the National Party. Uh, we all know that over there, the vote was really close, and Kimberly Ellis has yet to kind of concede um, after four months. So what's your message to California Democrats about the CDP's priorities, and how should the state party and the DNC continue to navigate the divide as we go look, into 2018? Look, it's unfortunate sometimes that candidates have a really difficult time acknowledging their defeat, and that's part of what's going on right now. And Kimberly seems to be developing a new kind of persona in which she's she's visibly being a critic of the Democratic Party, not just in California, but nationally. And she's doing a lot of that right now. And that's probably a good place for her to be because she's felt comfortable, I think, in the outsider role. Um, I can tell you that since I was elected on May the 21st, we moved right in. We restructured the style of way the party is run. We implemented for the first time a shared governance model amongst all five officers. So it's not as it has always been a chair-driven organization, but rather all five officers are working together to implement new policies and to implement all kinds of modernizations and reforms. Um, I changed the way the party is staffed, flattened out the structure. There's no more executive director. There are four division directors who all report directly to me. And plus, uh, we've, we're opening a Los Angeles office where there's a fifth director. And so we're moving the party in a different direction that way. Um, a as an example of the newly energized leadership, yesterday being um, Labor Day, all five party officers were out and about. I myself spoke at four different labor events up and down the northern part of the state yesterday. We all culminated together at the Sacramento Central Labor Council last evening um, at the end of the day. And, and it, is, it is part and parcel of a new approach to the Democratic Party. You know, I, being a little bit different, as somebody who started out as an activist many years ago, became the president of a Democratic club, grew it from 220 members to 1,143 members, then eventually got elected chair of the LA Democratic Party, um, where I built it from an organization that had a $50,000 a year budget and a one-half-time employee to an organization that has a $2.5 million budget and six full-time employees and grows, you know, expands and contracts as, as the, uh, the, the season warrants. Um, it's the kind of thing that set me up for this, and then, of course, eight years being the vice chair. There's a lot of work healing people. But the first true and real major step was the executive board meeting, the first executive board meeting of, uh, of the California Democratic Party, which occurred uh, a little over a week ago. And at the end of the executive board meeting, Rather than there being demonstrations and frustrations and people, you know, people really acting out their fears and their anger and their hostility and whatever, I had more people who didn't vote for me come up and say, I didn't vote for you, but I think you did a great job this weekend. It's the best executive board meeting we've ever seen. And it was very intense and very focused and very delegate and activist-centric. And it's part and parcel of a belief that our party here in California, which is the most successful state party in America still has to adapt and modernize and change. And I don't believe we can do this, and I'm sure this is probably what Chelsea's going to ask me about after, but I don't believe we can spend the next four, the next four years you know, trashing Trump every day, even though we have to trash him every day because he's trash. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I think we have to offer people something. Right. And see, it isn't just like, oh, well, we have to have a message for millennials. Well, we have to have a message for working men and women. We have to have a message for people in the Rust Belt. We have to have a message for seniors. And they're not all exactly the same message. But there is one key part of all of it, and that's that you come first. It is not about the, puck, the party and its structure. It is about how we build our politics in an inclusive way where we listen to people, where everybody's, uh, everybody's viewpoints are considered 
and where we actually make our primary focus on those people who are, who are most at need, most at risk, and most dependent on the party, they come first. And at a time when in Washington, D.C., they're looking to take away the right to vote, they're looking to eliminate public education and corporatize it, they're looking to kick young immigrant kids out and separate them from their families, they're looking to take away the right to collective bargaining, they are looking to take health care away from people, and they're looking to deny that climate change exists, and oh, by the way, they're looking to expand our war presence all around the world. <laughs> the one place in America where we can push back and fight back is here in California, because we own this place. So we not only have to do what we have to do in California to win, we have to show leadership for all of America. Because I can tell you, I've been all across the country campaigning, and I know from the feedback that I get in mail and Facebook and Twitter um, how people react. They look to California for hope. And the last thing I'll say, because I know you want to ask me other questions, <laughs> every Democrat who's been elected president since and including Franklin Delano Roosevelt, with one exception, everyone has run on a platform of one thing, hope. Whether it was, whether it was FDR and, and the WPA and then creating Social Security, whether it was uh, John Kennedy running on the um, New Frontier, whether it, was, whether it was Lyndon Johnson running on the Great Society, Bill Clinton ran as the man from hope, Barack Obama ran as hope and change. What, what Democrats and progressives and independents who lean to the left look for is hope. Think about every Republican who has run and won with the exception of Ronald Reagan's second term. They always run on fear and anger. And when Democrats try to run on fear and anger, our voters don't react that way. They repel to that. And that's part of what happened last year. We did not put forward this positive message. We actually have plenty we could say, right? My assistant is 26 years old. He served in the military. He had full GI Bill to pay for his tuition at college. But he has $26,000 in debt student loans to pay for his living expenses. Mm. Yeah. That's mm -hmm. not America. Yeah. Well, I do want to, I want there's a lot of, um, <clears throat> we talked, you talked a lot about um, policies that the Democratic platform, that, that California needs to lead on, and that we typically talk about, we talk a lot about on this show. So I want to talk about uh, SB 562. Okay. Senator Lara single payer bill happening in California, uh, recently endorsed by the CDP executive board at the last meeting in Anaheim. Um, what are your thoughts on Speaker Rendon's decision to kind of sideline the bill and in, in, in favor of creating a select committee to kind of study it? Um, and then the follow up question would be or, well, and then from his standpoint, which is how do you pay for something? Like, how do you explain that piece of it? Well, so, so, uh, and, and I'll tell you, I've been a single payer supporter for over 30 years. That's what drove me from. I'm a registered nurse, that's my background, and I got into politics because exactly health care reform. SB 562 is a great framework to start with. I support it fully. The funding mechanisms are not fleshed out as fully as they could be, but they can be fleshed out. And I'm hopeful that as the, t as the select committee works through it, they'll actually put the flesh on the bone, as they say. Now, the problem is is that in the way we normally would think about how you fund single payer if we we're going to have it in California, we always calculate in the Medicaid, or Medi-Cal as we call it here, and Medicare dollars that go to Washington. This is what Rendon raised as such a big issue because it takes, amongst other things, a thing called a Section 1115 waiver, which nobody believes that Trump and his administration will give us, which would mean that whole $2 billion, two and a quarter billion dollars, we have to find it somewhere else. Um, here's the bottom line. This is what I believe. As somebody that was a clinician for 12 years doing trauma-intensive care in ER nursing in inner cities and then moved into running hospitals and then became um, a regulator because I was a deputy insurance commissioner for the state for four years, so I'm pretty qualified on how all this stuff actually works. If we give everybody insurance, it takes away a huge cost that we pay because people don't get as sick, don't end up in the hospital at a point of last resort. And, and I'll give you a, a live example of a hospital that I was running where we had 
two kids come in with measles, measles. We ended up with 16 kids with measles, six of whom ended up in the intensive care unit. Something that could have been prevented with vaccines that cost you know, a couple hundred dollars at most ended up costing the community tens of thousands of dollars because all of these kids were uninsured. They were the kids of farm workers because it was an agricultural county. So while some of it is self-healing, some of it does require a lot of additional money and taxes have to be brought in. it. And the money that, that employers currently pay to insurance companies has to come back to us. What we know is that insurance companies take anywhere from 24 to 34% of our premium dollars and it goes to things like advertising, it goes to things like commissions, it goes to things like paying stockholders, profit. And ridiculous that CEO and, and pay? Ridiculous CEO pay, mm -hmm. well, which is, which is why, that there's, why there's likely to be an executive uh, compensation initiative appear on the ballot sometime in the next few years. This is an important thing, though. We get that, if we get even, let's just say Medicare runs at 45 or 5%. Okay, and in, in administrative costs, if if we got back from an average of thirty four percent, twenty four percent, or yet twenty percent, that helps us cover an extraordinary portion of those people who are currently not insured. Problem with insurance generally is that it's based on what are called risk pools, and so for somebody my age, and I'm a couple of years older than you, <laughs> I need people like you in the pool because theoretically you're not going to get sick and I'm likely to get sick, heaven forbid. So it's, a, it's about balancing risk, right? And that's why we're subsidizing health care so that young people are in the pool. Um, I just want to get the insurance companies the hell out of the way. Makes sense to me. All right, so let's talk about my favorite subject, or one of them, campaign <laughs> finance. Um, lots of fellow progressives and some democratic socialists are really pushing this uh, clean money campaign, dark um, money out of California politics. And recently, a judge invalidated a campaign, a public finance campaign uh, law that voters had passed, right. or no, wait, G Brown had signed. Brown had signed. And, uh, and the, the court said that we can't do that because of Prop 73, which says that the state cannot use taxpayer money for. Yeah, I don't think it's Prop 73, but whichever. Some so. that was what. What did you think right. about that logic and so, well, what's so, going to go so, next? So let's, let's back up on on this on this whole issue. First of all, I mean, I kind of think it's nice to be able to use the devil's money to do God's work, as the expression <laughs> goes. I mean, I personally would like to be able to take the oil company's money and use it to, to, to fight climate change, but that's a whole other story. Um, I think the first and foremost, the simplest reform that we should and must have is 100% disclosure within 24 hours of any contribution over $100 on the internet. Period. Should be no dark money groups, should be no, you know, no nonprofits that get to evade it. Second thing is I think public financing of campaigns can and should be doable. We do it in the city of LA. The problem is the judiciary has been stacked against it for a while. In Arizona, they implemented a, um, a, a taxpayer-funded campaign uh, funding law, and the United States Supreme Court threw it out. And part of the reason they did it is because the way these programs are usually devised is if somebody violates the cap, the maximum they're allowed to raise, or to usually to put in out of their own pocket, then therefore your amount that you can get from the taxpayers increases. And so the Supreme Court says, well, you know, that's not fair, that's bogus. And that gets us back to what the real problem is here. Years ago, the United States Supreme Court said your money is the same as your First Amendment political speech. My money is a thing that goes in my pocket that I use to pay for nice things. My political speech is what I say. So that's not my money. Second of all, the next problem they created was Citizens United by saying that corporations have a life of their own and they have beating hearts and they're human beings. Okay, most of the corporations I know are pretty deadly. I think they're ghosts and ghouls <laughs> and goblins. I, somebody told me about a bumper sticker they saw that said, I'll believe corporations are people when Texas executes one. <laughs> okay, well, that's exactly the point. So, so, I mean, I think we have to deal with those two issues. Um, look, there, there is a problem with unilateral disarmament. 
And I know a lot of progressives say, we just have to stop taking all that money. But we don't have Koch brothers, right? In California, there is one billionaire who supports the Democratic Party, Tom Steyer. And, you know, uh, there were maybe three or four in the entire country. And as long as money is at the centerpiece of, of, of our campaigns, it's terrible. Imagine this. To run a week of television advertisements in a state of California, statewide, costs, depending on how much TV is going on, anywhere between two and a quarter and three and a half million dollars for one week. I mean, nuts. this is, by the way, this is nuts. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is nuts. The, the fairness doctrine that used to exist where federal law said that if I gave you a license to have a television station on the public airwaves, you had to at least allow free public discussion, debate of political issues, and it was overturned, shut down. Mm -hmm. So in this system that we're in, you have to do mailers, you have to do digital ads, you have to do TV, you have to do cable, and all this stuff costs money. When I ran for chair of the California Democratic Party, my entire electorate was 3,400 people. But because I had to go up and down the state, I spent probably $60,000 just in travel expenses. Mm. Plane fares, hotels, having somebody go with me, eating. I mean, it's insane. So we haven't yet found a system to replace that. And I think it's time that we do. But I want to say this. The Disclose Act, even in its more limited form um, that it's in right now, is a start on the disclosure side. We could, ama amazingly, you don't have to compete dollar for dollar. We can have less money than they do or they, whatever. But if people know who's funding these things, that goes into their psyches yeah. and helps make decisions. It's when we don't know. Absolutely. Right. And that's where the dark money right. frame is so Or bad. when they say, California f Californians for nice people. <laughs> that's where this money is coming from. And you're like, who the heck is Californians <laughs> for nice people? Right, right, those Correct. kinds of names. That's absolutely yeah. right. Well, listen, we've got a lot. So next year, California has a lot of races coming up where hopefully a lot of our candidates will start to kind of disclose where they're coming from. We've got a governor's race. We've got an attorney general's race. We've got the U.S. Senate race. If Dianne Feinstein decides she does or does not want to uh, um, to run for office. And a lot of – and all congressional seats are up this year. Um, so we there, hope there, – There are 100 – there are 100 – um, legislative seats plus from the 50, state plus 53 congressional races there are nine statewide races including the United States Senate and there are two or three board of equalization seats which are also constitutional offices all of that is on the ballot so a lot yeah so a lot coming up for California so we definitely want you to come back on this show because we have so much to talk about as we get into those races, as we can kind of follow up on the Disclose Act and finance money and, and messaging. And, and messaging yeah. well, and so, so, so we need to talk about messaging. We also need to talk about how people can actually effectively engage. Because I want to say, I want to say this: money is very important, but nothing sells a voter more than when one human being looks another human being in the eye, speaks from the heart about an issue that really matters to them. That brings people in deeper. Television is what you call a shotgun approach. You can't target it. But when I talk to you and I look in your eyes and I talk to you about health care, which obviously I'm passionate about, or education, which is the other thing I'm really passionate about uh, besides health care, nothing beats that in terms of convincing people, A, how to vote, and B, to actually go and vote. And the other thing we need to up tell your listeners about is all of the new changes in the voting laws that are upcoming because it's going to – dramatically change voting in California. Yeah, so we like I said, we got to come back. We definitely have more time because there's so much uh, uh, I wish we had more time. Like I wish there was always more time within an hour. You can't pack <laughs> anything in an hour. So we definitely want you to come back and to kind of talk about those next steps for Californians. <coughs> Excuse me, because I do think that we know in this program, the way that we've kind of restructured this program is that the educational purpose of this show is very important to us. We want to make sure that we're getting that information out to people, um, especially not only here in California, but across the country as well. So you definitely got to come back. Um, Thank where you. Where can they so follow you, for, you, you on Twitter? At, you it's can like follow me very Bellman. easy. At Eric Bauman. <laughs> <Eric Bellman. laughs> okay, and, 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 you know, you can find me 
On Facebook, it's really easy. <laughs> Eric Bauman, B A U M A N. Thanks for coming in, Mr. Chair. Appreciate it. Thanks we'll for see having you soon. me. We'll Chelsea, I'm looking forward to it. And by the way, the next time I come, let's have a nice bottle of single malt scotch. I told what I, I, I told somebody else. I said, you, you know what? Put I should money have put, on that. Put, put some scotch. Yeah, in that he was going to ask for that. All right, we'll see what we can do we'll next see what we time. We'll see we can do next time. Alrighty. <laughs> All right. Um, now, shall we turn to the we'll breakdown? breakdown? We're going to break down some things. So each week in the breakdown, we'll talk about some policy or political situation and try and bring some additional clarity to it. Yeah, so uh, today was the final day in the White the, the final day of the White House had to decide whether or not to renew the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Chelsea, can you give us just a quick like overview of DACA? Yes. All right. So like Drexel said, it is the uh, deferred action for uh, childhood arrivals and it was an executive order by the Obama administration in 2012 uh, because Congress wasn't really moving much on immigration at all <laughs> and it basically allowed the children children brought here by their parents un undocumented to um, to work and study here if they sort of registered um, and they would get a two-year period of deferred action, uh, which was renewable every two years, uh, unless they did something to violate the terms. Um, it has so thus far affected 800,000 individuals, as far as I know, who have uh, signed up for it and applied for deferral. And uh, President Obama tried to actually expand it in 2014, but then was faced with a bunch of lawsuits from Republican states. And uh, those lawsuits went to the Supreme Court, which at the time was short of one justice, and we landed on a 4-4 tie, um, which kept an injunction in place uh, up to this time. And then Jeff Sessions, uh, we know has deported, even without this announcement today, at least one dreamer already. And uh, That was Homeland, like in June. Right. Yeah. So, so where, that's where we are. So, 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 so now we're at where we are. Where are we right now? As of today, the Donald Trump and the Trump administration decided to end uh, the Obama administration's executive orders on DACA. Uh, but with the six month de the delay, they were like, yay. So Congress yeah. hasn't figured this out in decades, right. but they're going to figure it out in six months. Right. Because these are people that Trump loves, so he says. And so. And has great heart for. Right. But, but the crazy thing about it is, is that. For the past two weeks, or since we had kind of been ge gearing up to this point, uh, Republicans like Paul Ryan, John McCain, Jeff Flake, Orrin Hatch, business leaders had all pressured the White House to save DACA, uh, with Lindsey Graham and Dick Durbin putting forth emergency legislation that Trump and the DOJ had suggested uh, Congress put forth. Uh, Lindsey Graham today said, "You to Dreamers, you've done nothing wrong. You came here as children. You've contributed to society, which is really crazy to me because I'm like, if Congress, if, if, if Republican leaders really wanted to push this legislation to be right now, they're worried about tax, the tax, uh, tax bill right now. Um, they could call an emergency session and get it done, uh, but they're not going to do that because that's not on um, their priority, priority list. Because yeah. at the same time, you've got several Republican attorneys general um, promising to sue the federal government over DACA, which would put the Republican administration, the Republican Congress, against states who. Republicans tend to value states' rights. Right. Um, but at the same time, and they're also being threatened by now the Democratic attorney generals and governors um, to do that. So that's kind of where they are right now. Um, I know Barack Obama, uh, President Obama, had a statement today. A lengthy um, one. A very lengthy Facebook post I saw today. Um, he said, this action is contrary to our spirit and common sense. Uh, ultimately, this is about basic decency. This is whether we, we are a people who kick hopeful young strivers out of America or whether we treat them the way we'd want our own kids to be treated. It's about who we are as a people and who we want to be. Um, and then the president, office, President Obama had previously stated he wouldn't make a comment uh, about as traditional as presidents, tradi former presidents traditionally do about their pres predecessors um, unless certain things from his administration were attacked. Um, uh, Affordable Care Act, yeah. DACA. Um, so now here, here is that. That's where we are right now. <sighs> so Democrats have said that dreamers are not a bargaining chip. However, Republicans will need Democratic votes to help raise the debt ceiling by the end of the month. So they may end up being, being a bargaining chip. Chips. Um, and uh, so, like, what does it all mean? to us other than what we just kind of told you. Uh, here to talk a little bit more about that via Skype is immigration attorney Belen Gomez. Hi, Belen. Thanks for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having me. 
All right, let's dive right in. This announcement today, what does it mean for immigrants in this country? Well, as you said, today's announcement rescinded DACA, meaning 800,000 dreamers are now in a very vulnerable situation. Many of them came as children. They're going to be placed with in this reality that in the coming months that their protections are over. Um, no new initial applications will be accepted. Um, only those with DACA protections that are expiring between now and March 5th will be able to renew for continued protection for the next following two years. That comes with the work permit. Um, but if, if they have a card expiring after that date, they're pretty much out of luck without protection, without the ability to work here lawfully. Um, and so it really, it is, like you said before, it's very un-American. We ask these children to come forward, to say that they were undocumented, to give their information, to pass all these background checks, giving their fingerprints, giving their family and situation, their family information. And now they're going back and saying, okay, we're taking this away. We're using you as a bargaining chip to get these other things that the president couldn't get passed on his own, um, such as the wall that he wants to build between Mexico that he want, now wants the taxpayers to pay for. Also the race act, which would eliminate 50% of the green cards issued per year. So it really, it's an attack on immigrants. It's a scapegoat. The American people aren't falling for it. Yeah. And normally when we think of immigrants, we're thinking of the immigrants that come from our southern border, right. but this doesn't just affect Mexicans and Guatemalans and Salvadorians. Who else does it affect that people aren't really thinking about? Yeah, so a lot of people um, didn't just cross the border without inspection <laughs> from Latin America. There's people from all over the world, really, who came on visas and just never left once that visa expired. So really, there's, there's a lot of Asian Americans or, you know, Asian children or now adults, um, people from all over the country, from all over the world um, that have DACA. Um, so that, that's who's, who's being most affected. We are seeing, there was a, a study that was done, um, pretty much a, a very huge survey conducted of these DACA applicants um, asking them, you know, have you gotten increased pay? Have you, were you able to buy a home? We're able to many things. And we're seeing that 12% of DACA recipients have been able to purchase their home. A lot of the DACA recipients have been able to get increased pay or a job or higher education. So these are people already embedded in our communities. Um, there's no reason to take away protections. They're actually contributing, not, even, not just in their taxes, but in the services that they're providing. Um, one of the justifications that was false that Jeff Sessions gave today was that these um, young people are taking away other people's jobs. But uh, there again, we're seeing that the economy is doing better, not because of this administration <laughs> so much, but just in general. Um, and that the, the, the jobs that DACA recipients have been able to obtain are in industries that were in short supply are because these people have been educated here, are highly bilingual, are highly skilled. I personally know some people who have been able to go to law school without papers and not obtain any help from the government, any help, any types of benefits. So if we're talking about wanting the best and the brightest, why aren't we seeking a protections for the people who are here homegrown pretty much in all other aspects, Americans. Absolutely. So what are the next steps for those who are affected by DACA? Obviously, there's going to be a little bit of a grace period. Um, and who, so what are, the, what are the next steps for them? And then who can they contact, um, you know, to kind of help them through these, these next few months um, until Congress actually legislates? Yeah, definitely. So I would encourage anybody, especially who has a removal order or had a case open previously in um, the immigration courts to seek an attorney, an immigration attorney, as soon as possible, they will be at risk of being removed. And we have seen that this administration has already removed DACA recipients 
Um, so they definitely are at the most risk. Um, anybody who probably has some sort of a criminal conviction um, should consult with an attorney. And that would just be to see if they have any other options available to them. But the fact is that the majority of DACA recipients are young people. So they're not married, they don't have children, they don't really have any other way of staying. Um, so we'll, it, it is difficult, but people should definitely consult with an attorney. Um, this was a highly unpopular decision, as you stated, even among the Republican Party. Um, so the, the problem that the president is faced is that he was frustrated with not being able to complete many of the things he would like to. Um, so he's using the Dreamers as a bargaining chip. He wants to get other un, unpopular measures passed, like the wall, like the Race Act. Um, and so what we're seeing in the, is an assault on immigrants, scapegoating them for problems that the president thinks that we're having. Um, so um, aside from those individuals seeking uh, help from experienced immigration attorneys, um, what other people can do like allies, a, a lot of the DACA people are also from mixed families. So they have people in their families who are born here, are citizens. Um, and so really what we would see is the tearing apart of those families. Um, is aside from seeing an, an immigration attorney, their families, their allies could help and support, push their representatives to pass a DREAM Act without all that other garbage. So why should Americans pay for a wall that's not necessary? Why should we cut green cards when we see that, you know, lawful immigration is, you know, a, a really Benefit. helping the U.S. economy? Um, so those are some things that we can do internally. Each state has, um, it, like for example, in California, adopted its own measures. Locally, people can try to make their cities sanctuary cities. Um, so there's there's different types of ways to go about it. Some states are suing the government because it's affecting their state in a negative way. Um, so so there's a variety of measures, but definitely people should seek the help of a licensed attorney. Um, we don't want to see people falling prey to notaries, notarios, um, people who don't really know much because we as attorneys see people's cases get ruined when they don't get the help from somebody who really knows what they're talking about. Well, that is a lot to digest. And I know, I know a lot of my friends are dreamers. I know a lot of their friends are dreamers. So this is obviously something that, um, that we will you know, that's not only affecting people who are affected by DACA, but their but mm -hmm. friends and family right. um, as well. So we definitely want to thank you for your insights on this, Belen, and, and uh, taking the time out to chat with us about this. And if somebody wants to get your advice, where they where can they find you? At the law office of Belen Gomez, um, and I can be reached at 714-449-1581. You can find me on social media, on Facebook, law office of Belen Gomez. Instagram, Twitter, um, all that stuff. So <laughs> thank you so much, and thank you for all you do. Thanks so much. You know, Thanks I was, for I was um, Chris Kobach today, Kansas Secretary of State today. He said uh, he was on the news today, and it was really weird. And he said something like, um, "They can go. They can just these people can just go back and then come back in. Like they could just, like like they what? can go home." He said they could go home. Oh. And they can just. I was like, "Go but home." Home is where home. the heart And is. I literally, I was like, "Go home where?" Right. These people don't. These kids don't know what home is. America to the, like it was just really odd to me that he would say that. Um, so yeah. So thanks to Berlin um, for that information. Um, and now the spotlight. And now the spotlight. All right. So going back to well, let me first introduce what the spotlight is. Um, it's where we're going to highlight a person, an organization, or something that we think that the viewers should check out. And this week and listeners. Oh viewers yes, of and course. And listeners. <laughs> We got to come up with one word that encompasses both. But um, be that as it may, we, this week we want you to check out All Hands Volunteers. They're a nonprofit that's on the ground in Texas, helping with the rebuilding efforts um, following Hurricane Harvey. They're a volunteer-powered disaster relief organization dedicated to to rebuilding hope all around the world, not just this country, um, after parts have been hit by natural disasters. Over the last 12 years, they've helped 39,000 volunteers give 
200,000 days of work and impacted half a million people. And this is the fourth time that All Hands Volunteers has been um, on the ground responding to Gulf Coast region um, disasters just in the last two years alone. They've got teams in Houston right now working to assess the damage, the need, out with chainsaws, clearing debris, talking to homeowners. So this, they're, they're there on the ground with the people. And uh, they are supported by a lot of big names, some of which um, you would recognize and some are which like people would normally give money to, like the Red Cross, which has recently come sort of under fire and scrutiny for questionable ways in which they handle their money. But even the Red Cross handles all, ha uh, donates to all hands volunteers. And so you may want to give your money to all hands volunteers directly. And it's also um, supported by another uh, nonprofit that's very near and dear to my heart, the Happy Hearts Fund, which was started by Petra Nemkova to help rebuild schools that have been struck by natural disasters all around the world. Um, I, I know her, I admire her, I trust her, and if her organization is giving as much money as the, uh, the disclosure forms say, and she believes in this cause, then I'm confident in endorsing them. So I hope you'll check them out. Go to hands.org. That's a great website. I know. I, and, and I know we have a clip of the, I mean, a, a photo of the, uh, um, of the actual uh, splash page uh, for All Hands. And if you well. go to that website, you can not only donate, but you can sign up to volunteer. That'd be great. It's a, it's a great, it's a great, organ. like, I love these organizations because like, everybody thinks of the Red Cross and they don't necessarily think about the other organizations. Like, Ruby Rose today had donated to a very LGBT specific, not today, uh, had donated a million dollars to a very specific LGBT uh, hurricane relief fund uh, because we know that a lot of the state money a lot of these marginalized groups don't necessarily see that money. We think of families and homes that are being displaced, but we don't think about um, uh, displaced youth who are, we don't think about homeless people, we don't think about displaced youth, we, th we don't think about single, we think about, um, you know, a, a very standard, standard families. families. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so check out All Hands Volunteers. Uh, so now we're in the final beat. That was fast. This was a long, this was a action-packed show, action -packed show. Um, going forward here in the final beat uh, we'll in, typically in this section uh, we're gonna give some viewer feedback uh, so you can tweet at us at political beat TV or you can email us at the political beat TV at gmail.com and Chelsea and I will be looking at that and then we will be bringing that uh, to the show because coming up this season you can look forward to us highlighting um, Democratic candidates across the country, like next week's guests from the California's 25th Congressional District, running to replace the horrible <laughs> Republican Steve Knight. Tell us how you really feel. Uh, Katie Hill, uh, Democratic candidates Katie Hill and Brian Caforio are going to be on the show tomorrow. We have an announcement mm -hmm. um, that's going to be coming out. So uh, make sure to follow Chelsea and I and uh, the show's Twitter pages uh, and the AfterBuzz um, at AfterBuzz TV for that announcement tomorrow because it's huge. We're very excited about it. Uh, it just came down today, so be sure to uh, check that out tomorrow. We'll be joined by some of our favorite politicians like Kentucky Secretary of State Allison Lundergan Grimes, who recently ran against Mitch McConnell. Yeah, we met her at Politicon this year. She's very yes. nice. She's very sweet. She's Kentuckian. Um, I wish she would send us some bourbon so we could drink on the show. So that's, that's just, just putting that out well, there. Yeah, nice, <laughs> nice, nice, subtle way to put that out there. We've got journalists who will come on, organizations, and our favorite after buzzers like Scott Moore and the host of The Trump Report, Christian Blatt. And started starting Fridays next week, a brand new segment. Our newest member of Team Political Beat, Brooke Solis Taylor, will start giving you rundowns of the week on Fridays via our social media on AfterBuzz TV um, and Political Beat TV. Yeah. So it's kind of like a, it's kind of like how we will give you the first beat. We'll give you the headlines, and then Brooke will finish out the week with the headlines that we couldn't get to. And it will be called the Buzz. So follow AfterBuzz TV on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook for that. And of course, don't forget to check out the Trump Report following this program if you're watching live. Uh, the Suits After Show, which I love that show on USA on Wednesday, and the new AfterBuzz Weekly, which just starts, which starts on Fridays, which will give you guys um, a rundown of everything that's happened throughout the week here at AfterBuzz Network. Uh, thanks to Chairman Eric Bauman and Attorney Belen Gomez for joining us on this week's show. Be sure to leave your comments on YouTube and subscribe to The Political Beat on Apple Podcasts. Chelsea, I'm well, so 
excited to be back with you. Yes. All right. We we'll see it. you all next Tuesday. <laughs> we'll see you next Tuesday. Right here. On the political beat. See you then. From executive producers Maria Manunos, Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire AfterBuzz TV staff, we would like to thank you for listening to the AfterBuzz TV network. To watch or listen to other After shows and post comments or questions, be sure to visit AfterBuzzTV.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of AfterBuzz TV. Buzz, Buzz you later. later. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.